Hello ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to another video. Today we'll be discussing a really important effect in the markets called the bullwhip effect, where small changes at the beginning of a cycle can have dramatic ramifications at the end. And of course, what the Federal Reserve in the US will have to do to combat this moving forward and what the market's telling us about it. The other thing that we'll be talking about is the key levels moving into the inflation report. Now we've had fake inflation report numbers already released, but damage control teams are coming out. We'll look at that. We have defended zones at certain levels in the market, and we also have a huge chance of incredible volatility over the next 24 to 48 hours. So join us as we cover off on all the key levels to be looking at together. And of course, the big macro environment information about where yields are going in the future and why this is going to happen. Stay tuned. This will be a good one. Well, welcome back everybody to The Daily Show and let's begin by talking about the June inflation report. Of course, we have a fake report coming out here from the US Bureau of Labor Statistics or the fake bureau in this case, and it showed an incredibly highly elevated number in terms of inflation reports. Now, markets were kind of rallying a little bit through the day and then we saw a massive tank off after that. Part and parcel, it was for two reasons. One, the fake report kind of spooked everybody. But then on top of that, we ended up seeing, of course, the White House come out and do some damage control. Now, they know the number. And what they said here was that the number was going to be highly elevated. What's that telling us? Probably a higher number than most people expected, possibly higher than the forecast. And then they also came out and said it's already out of date. Now, Usually I don't necessarily agree with everything here, but I think we can all agree on one thing. Copper is down heavily, and we've also seen, of course, things like oil falling incredibly heavily. That tends to mean, plus some of the lead indicators that I use, that we have probably seen the peaking here of inflation. Now, I mentioned that probably about a month ago that it was starting to read that way, and I do believe demand is dropping like a rock, and we can see that in the statistics. It's a very important concept. And it also comes to what we want to discuss today, which is the bullwhip effect. Now, some of you might be familiar with this effect. It's been happening now for really all of 2020 into this period. But it's what happens now that becomes super interesting. So to understand the bullwhip effect, it's really about a supply chain. And of course, small changes in demand can have dramatic ramifications all the way through the manufacturing supplier and customer kind of databases here. The first thing to understand it, let's say we had a wholesaler that usually sells 1000 cans of tuna each week. Then the customers suddenly come in, the demand increases. What is the wholesaler going to do? Well, they're going to increase their orders. They're going to say, oh, maybe this is going to be a new effect. And of course, if it's not a seasonal effect, they already understand. They see it as demand, they see it as growth, and they start to purchase more, putting, of course, pressure on the next and next and next supply chain. Now, what this ends up doing is it means more things are manufactured, more things go through the supply chain. And at the end result, we end up getting a whole bunch of inventory at the supplier itself, because of course that demand may not hold up. And in this case, the bullwhip effect is what's in full force in these markets. We had an incredible spike in demand. The Federal Reserve has now started raising rates. That's dropping demand and pe making people fearful. And what are we seeing at the back end? The suppliers with heavy inventory starting to pile up in the docks. Now, most economists were already predicting this, but it's just a good example of how demand or how little changes in the manufacturing supply demand kind of process can really have dramatic ramifications at the end. And this is what will end up causing and forcing the Federal Reserve in many ways to start to cut the rate sometime in 2023. And we'll talk about that soon. Speaking of cutting rates, it's important that we understand asset allocation over those periods of time. So here's the great little quad chart in some ways between the way that interest rates move over time between weaker and stronger economies and of course interest rates being higher or lower now during low interest rate environments people like tech people like high yield obviously if the economies are weaker and you have a lower interest rate that's when you really get those strong moves and things like hyper growth and those types of ones but then we have on the other side where we are right now, which is obviously VIX and US dollar. Now, VIX is just because usually when we're in high inflation and low growth, 
we're basically in some form of recession, yeah? So that's why the US dollar in this case, or really any currency in general that's considered a hedge, becomes the best. They call it cash is king. Now for a long time, at least the start of 2022, these were kind of the go-to, especially energy and materials or metals in this case, uh, but everything's changing and we could easily be here or even here within the next six to 12 months, absolutely. So from an investment standpoint, remember, try to simplify your life in terms of allocation. If you just like indices, like we often do here for trading, that's fine. But if you wanna get a little bit more particular, this is one of the things. Asset allocation, super important within the sectors and within different asset classes. So we know that we're probably already in a recession. We can kind of see it by the way that the bull whip effect is working with inventories. We can see it with the firing that's going on across the board. Obviously, the tech lit companies tend to lead in losing jobs and, sell and basically firing people. Microsoft most likely has just fired a whole bunch of staff as well though I haven't confirmed that. I've just seen that that seems to be going around the rooms. And as we know, we have a probable recession drop. So at some point during most recessions, we drop around 32%. Now, Goldman Sachs have come out and they've kind of changed their, their case for the low point here over the next kind of six to 12 months. And they're saying around 3150, not 100% confirmed, but if you look at the metrics where things are going to sit, they're sitting around 3150 now, 3200. So that would be very much in line with the average drop off for an S&P 500 during a recession, which will probably happen later on. As we can see here, layoff numbers are increasing. This is something that we totally expect to occur. This should get worse before it gets better, unfortunately. And I would say that a lot of people will be hunkering down in their jobs, starting to feel fearful, and companies will continue to cut the fat to bring down the cost pressures of inflation. And this is usually a lagging indicator, which of course the market's already allocated for. So remember, jobs is lagging. That's why it's not really the best performer in terms of predicting crashes or predicting problems. By the time the problem's already there, yeah, we are, the market's already reacted to it. So we move into a very important day here. We move into the Wednesday. Of course, we have the CPI number. Now, historically, if we we're going off historical facts, this day and the next day tend to be very bullish statistics. Does that mean they're going to be? Absolutely not. But we'll look at the charts a little bit later on. And just interestingly, they're the statistical bull days that tend to go on in markets. So with the fake release and then the White House damage control team, what ended up happening in the market over the last 24 hours? Well, the big one I think for me was Dr. Copper. Dr. Copper weakened heavily. Now that's surprising. Basically what it showed here is that we've got continued demand destruction. Now, part of that I think is due to where the yields might have to be. And we'll take a look at that in just a few minutes. But basically when Copper falls off, it means that there is incredible economic weakness for anyone that's joining us the first time and people, because copper is used in all builds and basically the metals market is saying, no, 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 not so good. You're going to have to cut the rates in the future. Otherwise, this economy is looking very sick. So copper's front loading here, the idea of a cut rate in the future. Conversely to that, we often see people when they know that initially there's going to be a rate hike, people move into dollars and cash as we saw with that uh, lower or kind of higher inflation and lower economic growth. Really, the, the DXY is the main kind of preferred cash is king kind of thing. And we're moving into this point. But by now, a lot of people have already seen this as the trade. So it's already been ramping now for quite a few months. Cash has been very good. If it breaches through this level, of course, the, the level that could be the extreme zone might be a 120. But I do think that, that we're at a point where it makes sense that it might just try to hold a little bit. Recent price action on the last day doesn't really show too much. It just shows a doji, what we call a long leg doji. And these just mean there's an equilibrium between the buyers and the sellers. Effectively, there's a high, there's a low, and the open and the close are at the same level, which just really shows that the market's taking a pause. And why would it be doing that? Because we've got massive news just about to come out. Another one is yields, of course, depending on how yields react to this inflation data, we'll, we'll have a very good idea of where this market's going to go next. At this stage, yields have been increasing recently, which is never a good sign if the market's trying to actually recover. Usually increase yield, market goes down. 
And if we do end up seeing a spike in yields and markets go up, be careful very much of the bull trap at that point. We'll be following it along the line. So of course, subscribe if you're interested in that. So let's talk about the bullwhip effect in full force. Let's just discuss here what's going on. So basically the market has predicted what the Federal Reserve is going to do. I've spoken about this a few times, but I just think it's such an important point that many people have been messaging me about. It's super important that we all understand this as a community. At the moment, the Federal Reserve is effectively front loading all of their interest rate hikes. By December of 2022, it's expected that we'll be at an interest rate of 3.35% or higher in the US. Now, here's the good and bad news. That's actually not where it ends. Remember, this is the expected interest rate in the future by December. We're not even close to that right now. We're still under two. So the market's already predicting 3.35. Come into April 2023 with me. Let's have a look here at the rate, 3.43%. So what that's saying is it still has to go up even higher first. Now, imagine all those poor companies that are affected by the bullwhip effect. What's going on? They've got inventory st stacking up. Growth is slowing because of the huge level of demand that we saw. They've overordered, thinking it's real. It's now running out. So they've got stacked inventories everywhere. And that's, of course, going to force the Fed's hand at some point to say, well, wait a second, we need to start, you know, really thinking about the economy. That's going to put massive pressure on those. And of course, basically create a whole bunch of firings and layoffs. So by September of 2023, notice the rate change. The rate goes from a 3.4% all the way back down to the 3.12. So this will mean that basically we have a rate hike followed by a rate cut to try to protect the economy after what the market believes is going to be the Federal Reserve effectively destroying demand so much on the supply demand dynamics that they'll have to actually, they'll not only combat inflation, but then they'll have to push it down. Now, if you can somehow time around this area, it becomes super important as an investor or a longer term kind of swing trader to say, ah, okay, I now know that this market has probably combat inflation. Really the question you've got right now is, once we get past inflation, I believe, and I think many of you believe out there, the Federal Reserve will come back in to support the market because it's the nature of what they're doing. They're not gonna let this hard reset just yet. A hard reset comes off one particular thing, and that's usually when markets are led by land, okay? And what land means is that houses lead the recession. Very important. Just remember that in the future when you're doing things, there's a lot more to go into on that one. But realistically, when things are led by land, crashes are led by land, <laughs> be very, very, very scared. And that's got to do with dodgy lending and all sorts of things. Now, the GFC was not the only example of this. You can go back through history. There's more than that. But just a bit of a kind of heads up there. Let's move over to some other markets and talk about everything in terms of structure. First up, we'll stay with gold. Gold, of course, at a level of theoretical technical demand. Do I trust it? Absolutely not. If you were short it, well, you know, might be a level where people are going to take some profits ahead of the news. But in general, we had that kind of distribution from the previous session. We've shorted to a new low. Yes, we're at demand. I could easily see it going back down here. There is no bid by the big guys yet that we're seeing in terms of money flow. Gold is not king at the moment though it certainly could be moving forward. August tends to be a very strong month for it. We'll find out whether it switches. We'll watch gold at that point. Through the trend line at the moment, very weak, absolutely no signs of recovery just yet. Let's move over to Tesla here. Tesla's in the middle, actually held okay. So the stocks really did okay here in terms of 0.54% down, not as bad as it could have been. Obviously Tesla hit the resistance a few times. A lot of you guys like trading this one. Tesla, in my, in my opinion, is more of a proxy. We mentioned the volume profile in the previous session, end up holding this level perfectly ahead of the CPI number. So I would say it's at a demand or a support level right now. We'll find out whether it can hold. Another kind of commodity or thing that's showing demand destruction is oil. Oil obviously pressuring down at 95. I saw a few people, uh, I'm not gonna mention names too much, but people saying that this was the, the greatest level to buy it and stuff. Well, don't be so sure about that. This has followed the curve of really destruction. We have that huge ramp followed by a snap, followed by a trap, and now we're moving down. In many ways, this is a basically what we call a distribution. And if this does breach through the low, 
it really could mean that oil goes into a fairly large slump. In fact, oil could easily get back down to the 70s or 60s. You've got differing opinions here on this one. Obviously, that's a longer term approach to it, but we're at a significant demand ahead of the inflation number. This will be a very important point. And for anyone that's been trading short, I'm sure most people are looking at this saying, well, maybe I'm gonna take a little bit of profit. Remember, the current trend is down. They're the swings, and until you swing above that, you can't say, oh, well, it's looking much better, at least on the daily or these time frames. In the previous session, we reported the one hour and we talked about the switches that had happened here. So we had the switch long, which was bang, bang, bang. Then we had the switch short, which happened here. And that turned out to be an incredibly good positional. So two switches, very quick market. You've got to be on top of these things right now. And of course, trade oil at your own peril at this point. Let's move over to the DAX. What's going on with the DAX? Well. Not all bad, actually. Weekly, you can see here, we've got one week. We've got a second week, which is a bullish hammer. No follow through yet. And then we've got the last week. Now, this is all happening at a level of demand. While people are incredibly fearful, and we have seen incredible fear coming out of these markets, I did a poll of the community. Guess what? You guys voted 70%. This is about 3,700 people voted. We had 70% bearish, 30% bullish over this week. That's a pretty damning stat in terms of most people are bearish. Now, I tend to like the counter of what most people like, but of course you want to see that in price action. Ideally, everyone thinks the opposite way and you see it in price action and then you go, ooh, I know what's happening at that point. It makes it more sense of it. Let's move over here to the DAX. We've got the long leg doji, obviously the low, the high, the open and the close, indecision ahead of the inflation number. Markets don't know what to make of this just yet. And as we scroll down through the DAX, and of course, this is relevant to all markets around the world. You'll notice it's still intact with that inverse head and shoulders idea. There's the neckline, left shoulder, head, right shoulder. Such an important 24 hours. We breach past this level here, which is something like a 12,925. Then we get through the neckline. It could really point towards a nice little recovery here in markets. Obviously, we put pressure on this low. Well, back down we go and, and most likely we break through the 12.4. So this is this is like, you know, a very important next few days here leading into these markets. Some people will want to wait for the decision. Some people will just want to pull the trigger, but you've got to be nimble and fast and obviously try to have that patience and react, don't predict with these markets. Very difficult to predict exactly what's going to go on here. We did talk about turnaround Tuesdays. We'll just quickly discuss that in a, in a few seconds, but here's value of the Russell 1000 versus growth. You'll notice values come back to kind of a roll reversal on the double bottom. Will it bounce from here? I mean, history says that when value tends to outperform, it will usually outperform for a three year on average period. I think we're about one year of outperformance in at this stage, somewhere around, yeah, about one year, I think at this point. So. Will we get another two to three years of value outperformance? I don't know, but certainly it's at that point and some people will be wanting to look at that. Let's check out the Russell 2000 by itself and just have a look here. Again, critical point ahead of the big news. That's super important. We've got a series of higher lows, no higher highs here other than this one over versus this. So we're at critical area before the news. Obviously, some day traders will be looking for a break above here. And that's going to correlate very well to the S&P 500, which we'll look at soon. NASDAQ, what's going on there? Well, we have pretty much a level of support. I mean, it's uh, previous resistance, previous resistance, previous resistance, possible support. Nice rally on the NASDAQ early, hit almost 12,000, then instantly sold off. I want to use the futures market to show you guys this. Where does it all end here in terms of the rally? Well, to me, this 11,400, will you breach underneath here? Watch out down below because it's not going to be pretty. And we'll look at the S&P 500 to predict where it might go next. As we mentioned, if we do get low there, this seems like the logical conclusion. The markets love gravitating to the 200 SMA. If we go back through history, you'll notice the 200 SMA is very strong level and often hit by the markets during these times of extreme fear. 2012, 2016, 2018 into 19. And then of course the pandemic was so brutal it went through it. But this is a very common level, previous resistance highs before that last run, certainly possible here from the bear side scenario. Where does that activate? That's a question we get asked. Well, let's have a look at the two hour chart here. 
and talk about the current market action. Well, the big thing is we still not really through all the supports here. We've still got a kind of upward trending market in some ways, not the smaller time frames. And we have resistance, 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 possible demand support line around that 3800, 3820. Look, it's it's weak. We'll talk about a big key zone, but for us, it's all about the 3880. 3880 breach up. I believe it's going to make a new high here and probably keep running. That's a huge zone. We'll talk about that soon. For the bears though, underneath here, 3740, we get underneath that demand. We've already picked up many times on this demand on the channel. We've spoken about it. It gets under there, oh, watch out. <laughs> it's gonna be very, very bad because at that stage, yes, we might fill this gap, but I think it's all on in terms of the shorters will be out in, in some pretty big force at that point. Let's move over here to the theory of the previous session. So we had the theory of potentially turnaround Tuesday. Now. Generally, that does happen. Turnaround Tuesday is a thing. Often it will, whatever happens on Monday, statistically is actually often reversed on the Tuesday. But I wanna talk about a few things. If you were a day trader into the open, we actually got an incredible structural pattern. Anyone in the private community would know this. I talked about it in the session. And we actually had a really nice trade long pre-market. Now, you don't always get pre-market longs, but it does pay to have the ability to trade the futures. And the long came out so aggressively in the morning, it was incredible. Now, obviously by the time the market had already opened, we were already sitting around these levels, which was unfortunate, but there was actually a very nice little trade in here. What this did kind of confirm to us though, was that there's something going on around this 3880. So 3880 was resistance on the real market, obviously hit on the real market and then sold off. And then it tried to rally in the previous session, fake news came out, White House came out, everything went bad. You can see it went up and then just suddenly fell off a cliff. But if it gets through 3880, this is what we call a defended line now. This has got orders on it, supply. So if we breach supply, what are we doing? We're gonna be changing the trend to the upside on the one hour, on the 15 minute, on the five minute, on all the smaller time frames, including two hours as well. So if you're feeling bullish, maybe you wait until these kinds of locations and then try to pick the dip up. There's nothing wrong with being patient in those kind of areas. That's a good technical zone. The other one is of course where we are currently. Well, we're at a bit of miniature demand here ahead of the CPI news. Well, of course, if the CPI news is good, what do we expect? Well, we expect it to potentially ramp and move through. Now, conversely, it could even be bad news and the market could still rally. You don't necessarily know. That's the problem with this trade. We don't exactly know what Wall Street's gonna do regardless of how the news comes out. But certainly we get a new breach to the low. At that point, I think we're looking towards that 3740. If we breach 3740, then of course, the short is pretty much heavily on here and people will start to stack into that. We know Wall Street's already been positioning towards the short at the moment. Most people are short. Retail is short. Retail has the most amount of puts kind of open for a long time. Will we be correct or is it actually more likely that there is further trapping to do on the upside? If I was having a guess, and this is more of a guess based on current price action, while the one hour is down at the moment, I think if we breach through here, we're going into a bit of a squeeze. And at that point, we're probably going to go towards the short squeeze side. Um, as in the market will ramp and the market will put pressure on everybody. If we just have to bust, well, it just shows you how weak the economy is. We should be seeing a ramp around this period. Let's find out whether we do. It's gonna be a super, super big 24 hours. If you haven't already been following us, come and follow us over on Twitter. We do have at FX Evolution is our handle. Join us in Discord, 10,000 members in there. Our private community links down below if you're interested. And remember the big news is coming out this week. So be aware of it, 8.30 a.m. New York Times, core CPI and the CPI numbers. Then we scroll down and we've got the PPI numbers coming out Thursday, July 14th. And if we keep going, we've got core retail sales on the 15th, plus the big monthly expiry for options that we'll look at after uh, the next session. And then we have earnings the week after that. I mean, it doesn't get bigger than this, guys. The volatility is everywhere, nimble and fast trading. So good luck, and we'll see you in the next one. Bye for now.